Welcome to History of Health Information Technology in the U.S., History of Electronic Health Records. This is Lecture B, Evolution of Functional Requirements for EHRs. This lecture will describe some of the features that are desirable in an EHR. The objectives for this unit, History of Electronic Health Records, are to describe some early examples of electronic medical records, discuss lessons learned from the early EHR implementations, discuss how the attributes that were identified for a computer-based patient record in the 1991 Institute of Medicine report relate to the concept of meaningful use, discuss differences between the terms electronic health record, EHR, and personal health record, PHR. The Institute of Medicine, or IOM, is a nonprofit national advisory group on health matters. Its members are selected from leading experts in the country. In 1991, the IOM released a book entitled The Computer-Based Patient Record. In that book, published by the National Academies Press, the gold standard criteria or attributes for a computer-based patient record, or CPR, were described. We will use the term CPR when referring to these older Institute of Medicine criteria because we will also discuss the standards for an electronic health record that the IOM subsequently developed in the summer of 2003. Both the 1991 first edition of the computer-based patient record and the second edition of 1997 offered recommendations that remain today as the gold standard for features that should be incorporated into electronic health records. In fact, they also underlie the more recent recommendations for a good electronic health record. Finally, in part because of the desire for purchasing systems that will support meaningful use of electronic health records, there is more interest in the vendor community in incorporating these attributes. So let's take a look at them. The first essential attribute of a CPR is it should support a problem list that is able to be linked to orders and results so that the logic of the relationship of orders to problems is clear. There are many aspects of the clinical record that relate to the problem list. The physician may record the patient's primary problem or chief complaint in the patient's own words, or may record the patient's final diagnosis for the given encounter using standard terminology. While these relate to the problem list, the problem list itself is a regularly updated description of all the patient's problems, including new, active, or chronic conditions and historical or resolved problems. The problems are worded in whatever way the available data can support. So if a patient comes in with chest pain, until there are data to support a diagnosis of heart attack, the problem may be listed as chest pain. There also should be a place to record health status measures. These measures include the patient's ability to function in daily life. For instance, they might include anything from a patient's mobility to the patient's ability to work to any evidence of depression, in addition to specific outcomes related to a patient's particular medical condition. Recording these health status measures will facilitate the linkages of process and outcome measures. Currently, these patient-reported outcome measures are not routinely recorded in the medical record. This may be an example of the technology push idea. If the technology provides a mechanism for recording the data, maybe it will be more frequently recorded. There should be a place to record the rationale for decisions. This rationale may also be linked to clinical guidelines. For instance, a laboratory test may be ordered because the doctor wants to make sure the patient doesn't have a particular disease. 
This is known as ruling out the disease, and there should be a place to indicate that ruling out the particular disease is the reason for ordering the lab test. One of the most important aspects of a CPR is that it should be able to be integrated with other records. For example, records from other settings should be integrated with the current record. The outpatient and inpatient records or generalist and specialty clinic records or records over time should all be connected so that the record can truly be a lifetime medical record. Obviously, mechanisms for protecting confidentiality of information should be included. Tracking with audit trails of who has accessed the record needs to be included. These are now part of the HIPAA requirements and were recently strengthened as part of the HITECH Act. Timely access, both on-site and remotely, and with multiple simultaneous users, needs to be assured. At the same time, unauthorized updates need to be prevented. In addition, tailored views are necessary. This means that different specialties, departments, and even individual users can configure the system to customize the information and format that is presented to them. If you remember, that ability to customize to meet users' needs was one of the characteristics of several of the early electronic systems. The CPR should be able to provide easy access to both local and remote databases. These may be things like the Medical Literature Database, Medline, or National or Local Clinical Guidelines. For instance, medical informaticians at Vanderbilt University have developed point-and-click context-sensitive links to Medline or drug information databases. This system has been incorporated commercially in some of the McKesson Clinical systems. The CPR should assist and guide clinical problem solving by incorporating decision support tools. These might include a variety of tools including reminders, alerts, and other decision support tools. Again, this recommendation did not come out of the blue but reflected the functionality of some of the early systems. Not only should the CPR support direct entry of data by physicians, but it should also support structured data entry. This means there needs to be a defined vocabulary to describe what each element of the record means. This may not have to be an input vocabulary, but the database that underlies the record should be structured, even if physicians dictate using natural language. What may then be needed is a mechanism to link from the dictated language to the structured language. As you can imagine, this is not always an easy task. The CPR should be structured in such a way that it can support assessment of both quality and cost measures. Some of the other attributes, such as including functional and other outcomes measures, are part of this. Linking to cost data also needs to be a part of this attribute. And finally, if all this isn't enough, the system also needs to be flexible and expandable so that it can support evolving needs. It is obvious from this list that few systems are fully functional in all of these aspects. This is a picture of what the clinician will see in the EHR used in the Veterans Administration Hospitals, otherwise known as the VA. This EHR is known as VISTA. As you can see, it embodies many of the criteria we just discussed. There is a problem list in the upper left corner. There is a place for decision support in the section on clinical reminders in the middle, and the vital signs are recorded in structured form.
In 2003, the IOM's Committee on Data Standards for Patient Safety issued what was termed a letter report in which some of the key functional features proposed for an electronic health record, or EHR, were identified. One of the differences between the criteria for the CPR and the EHR is that the EHR assumes that there will be involvement and communication with and from patients as well as healthcare providers. Let's look at some of the proposed capabilities of the EHR. The functions of an optimal EHR are divided into three areas. Functions relating to direct care of the patient, those relating to supporting care, and the functions relating to the information infrastructure that underlies the EHR. The direct care functions include all the functions relating directly to care management, capturing all necessary patient information, managing orders for the patient, managing results reporting, referrals, etc., are all care management functions. Clinical decision support includes functions which inform the direct care of patients. Protocols, guidelines, drug interaction checking, alerts, reminders, and so forth fall into this category. Because the EHR should include patient involvement, clinical decision support functions also include functions for the management of patient preferences, self-care, and other functions related to the patient. Operations management and reporting include functions related to scheduling and communication among providers, as well as between provider and patient. It also includes more automated communication, such as communication with medical devices. Support functions of an EHR include functions to support direct clinical care, such as patient and provider demographic information. This might include age, race, gender, etc., scheduling and bed assignments, etc., as well as functions related to analytic, administrative, and financial activities. What this would allow is tighter integration of the clinical data with the financial and administrative data. In turn, it would provide more capabilities for quality improvement and similar activities. The final set of functions relate to the technical underpinning of the EHR. This will include security issues, as well as standards for vocabulary and other interoperability standards, so that different systems within and between organizations can talk to each other. These recommendations underlie some of the current recommendations for meaningful use of EHRs. The HITECH Act of 2009 has established policy and standards committees to make recommendations for EHRs. These meaningful use standards will evolve over time, but there are certain key elements that are included, and these will become part of the certification standards for EHRs as well. Requirements for clinical decision support, structured capture of quality measures, up-to-date problem lists, and information exchange are very similar to those recommendations from the IOM report of nearly 20 years ago, and the infrastructure standards are likely to echo the 2003 report in many ways. The high-tech recommendations are also similar to the functionalities of many of the early systems that came even before the original IOM report. Since the Meaningful Use Regulations came out, the use of certified EHR technology has increased tremendously. As of 2014, 97% of hospitals and 74% of physicians had adopted an EHR. Most of the functions of what constitutes a basic EHR are routinely used. These functions include the ability to record electronically patient demographics, problem lists, medication lists, and discharge summaries, as well as use computerized provider order entry for at least medications and to view lab, radiology, and diagnostic test results. 
A sizable number of providers are also using other functions, such as using CPOE for other types of orders and employing clinical decision support, which are included in what is known as a comprehensive EHR. This concludes History of Electronic Health Records. In summary, if we look back over the evolution of electronic health records, we see that the 1991 IOM report on the computer-based patient record is still the gold standard for EHR functionality today. Unfortunately, this is a standard that most of today's systems still don't meet. Yet, over 30 years ago, there were EHR systems that met at least some of these standards. Despite these examples and the IOM recommendations, it has taken the 2009 HITECH Act to finally spur broader development and use of EHRs.